up now to play some Atari 2600. Have some fun. keyboard requires me to hit the function button before I hit the F keys, which is really annoying because I need to use the, the switches in this game. So we're going to have a bait. And you can see how pretty bare bones this is. Um, you know, you can bar barely make out that this is a vacuum. 
that looks okay. The ghost bait, that's the marshmallow, or no, the Im image intensifier. That's what that is. Um, and then you got the traps, so you can just buy traps. Uh, you know, maybe three. Three's good to start with. And this was the whole thing with the, uh, you know, the most recent Intellivision version of the game of, of uh, Ghostbusters is that, um, you know, people are wondering what the difference is between the two. And the first one that came out by Dino uh, from Inti Home pretty much mimics this game. And the new one that came out, the Ghostbusters Ultimate Edition, pretty much mimics the original Commodore 64 version. Which, uh, you know, if, if you really enjoy the game, I would, I would say you'd want to go with that one. Uh, but, you know, not that I'm going to knock the other one. It's just that uh, I think that's uh, what people would want to see, right? Okay. Let's start the game. Again, Kitchen made this. Uh, you know, one of the Kitchen Brothers. Really good at uh, making Atari games. Work for Activision.
house that's going to turn red or a city block or whatever it is before it does. That's, that's what I think it is. Um, but yeah, those, those are your only things in this version. Oh no! And of course, there's no talking in this one. Um, the Commodore 64 version had talking. Not a whole lot of talking. It, it said Ghostbusters at the beginning. Blind me. Oops. Oh, no. oh no, come on. Uh, and I think the only other voice it had was uh, when you completed the game, the uh, Ghostbusters all went, yay! <laughs> that was about it. This is gonna be tough because my keyboard. Sorry, the left. No, right. No, it was the right. The right difficulty. I forgot. I think it's the right difficulty. You have to flick it to um, activate the uh, bait. Because you have to think about um, Atari 2600, standard edition joystick only had the one button. Start a new game. Um, so yeah, so you need the ghost bait, you need the vacuum, and I like to buy at least three tracks. This is my problem. I have to have the keyboard like right here. Oh, 
makes that full blast. <laughs> How's that better? Because I have to have the stupid keyboard here. I can't have the mic in front of my face. That better? Hopefully. All right. Back to losing at the game. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. It's only because I had to have the stupid keyboard there. I'm like, I'm running out of desk space here. Normally I like to have the mic right in front of my face, but I had it off to the side so I could reach the keyboard. Ah! <laughs> Alright, maybe that's a, that's a sign I need to play something else. Oops. Let's see, what else can I play? So many great games. Let's let's torture myself with some minor 2049er because yeah. <laughs> Rex Warden is like to be fair, nobody wins when Ghostbusters for Atari NES are involved. Uh, I can vouch for that, yeah. <laughs> I want to see if I can just grab my chat there. I'm getting annoyed by having to turn my head over just to see the chat all the time. Yeah, that's better. Now I can see the chat. At the same time as seeing the screen. What a concept. Uh, let's see here. All right. <laughs> oh man, this, this version. You know, I, I so want to get good at this one, but I just don't know if I can. Television Gamer said I only played the NES version of Ghostbusters. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> I don't, I don't really like that one. I mean, I've played it too. I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. It's, uh, I, I don't like the way the car thing is. I don't like the, uh, I don't know. There's a few things about it. It just, it's not my favorite. I have a feeling I'm going to run out of time. One of the things about this version is they, they make the guy run so slow. And then they make the timer run out so fast. I didn't have computers until the early 90s. Well, that would that would make make sense there. Uh. I didn't know any better on Ghostbusters. Oh, well, well, you know, if you didn't have it, you didn't have it. I mean, you can't be faulted for that. I mean, I I grew up in the time where you know, a lot of people had the Commodore 64 on my street. We uh, all traded games with each other, so we pretty much had most of the popular titles. And Ghostbusters was one of them. Back in the day when we all had floppy disks and we would just copy each other's games like that was no problem. <laughs> we were all pirates back then. Oh crap, ah oh, crap, he turned, he turned on me. I recently uh, acquired this ver this game for the uh, oh no for the Intellivision um, programmed by Oscar Toledo G 
I always say G because I'll never try to attempt his last name. I, I just won't. I'll butcher it. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> I was born in 75. I knew one kid that had a C64 and one that had an Amiga. Yeah, I was born in 76. And, uh... I don't know. I, I, there, there was a few different uh, computers on my street. I know my neighbors had a Commodore 64 as well. Um, actually, there was a few neighbors on my street that had a 64. There was um, some that had the, the VIC-20, the Commodore VIC-20. There was uh, one neighbor that had a ColecoVision, one that had an Atari. We had also an Intellivision. So there was quite diverse. I, did, I don't know if anybody had an Amiga. I don't think I've ever played on an Amiga before. Or any of the Atari computers back in the day. I didn't know anybody that had one. Up we go. You know, if they just made this guy move a little bit faster, this game would be a little bit more playable. Let's see if I can get this guy before the effects wear off. Go a little bit. Ah, oh, you stupid man. <laughs> I haven't even passed the first level yet. That's pretty bad. That's the other thing too. That this board, this is the first board on the Atari, and it's not the same as the first board on the the original version. I don't know why that is. I think this is like level two of the original. Like they just kind of skipped the first one. Maybe because it had ramps, like in you know Donkey Kong, the ramps, the girders were on a on an angle, um, you know, what, which was which was pretty hard to achieve back then. You know, Gary Kitchen when he when he made Donkey Kong, he really had to uh, <laughs> figure it out how to how to make the the ramps on the the first board. Um, originally, he was going to make it like this, where they were all straight, and. Uh, According to uh, what I heard him say was that um, David Crane kind of challenged him like, you know, if you worked at Activision or if it, if it was an Activision product, the girders would be on the uh, angles. So that's kind of interesting. You know, you have to think of the limitations of the system coupled with the time that the programmers had to make these games and I'm sure they would have just like said forget it you know I'm just gonna forgo any of those angled levels hey we got the Atari creep in the house everybody say hi to the creep I have to go all the way up, and time is running out. Yeah, not to mention having none of the shortcuts and exploits that modern programmers have. Yes, even I look at it like there's no way I'd be able to program in television games if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for Inti Basic, if it wasn't for, you know, me being able to use tools that are created by modern programmers to make things easier. I mean, my games would look like complete crap. <laughs> if, if I would even be able to figure out how to make a game without Inti Basic, I doubt it. I don't even know if I would even try. I mean, I, I understand basic programming, but... Oh no, I missed the spot.
Okay, I gotta get up there. Quick. Let's go, guy. <laughs> Alright, we just might make it. jump oh why did you you ah. you can't do machine code yeah no I've never learned it I've never I don't know I I bought the uh, book from uh, Oscar for, uh, programming on the Atari and it, it's programming in machine code or in as uh, what's it called um, not necessarily machine code well, maybe I have to go down this way assembly language and uh, I haven't actually spent any time to read the book yet yeah NES maker is is, a, is an interesting tool it kind of, um, you don't have to really know programming necessarily to, to use it. Although having a programming background might actually help you, but. Oh. All right, let's play something else. I always like to give this one a go. I always feel like I can get a little bit further every time. Sean the Great Gamer, how's it going? Get me some Goombas. This is a game I, I, I wish I would have uh, had the, the opportunity to buy the cartridge when it was out. Oh no! <laughs> I mean, you can you can probably buy them from people who do kind of like after aftermarket guess. Yeah, this is uh, this is called Princess Rescue. It was um, came out a few years ago. I'm not exactly sure when it actually got released, and it didn't last too long, as far as I understand. I don't know what uh, what transpired, and I'm sure people were worried about copyright infringement. <laughs> you know, back then when Nintendo was very very uh, protective of their IP. Well, they still are. Yet somehow they managed, uh, someone managed to squeeze out a Super Mario Brothers for the Intellivision. Um, and they, they, they really didn't try to hide it. It's actually called Super Mario Brothers. It's not even called something else. And it was, uh, it was for sale at uh, PGRE PRGE? I always say that wrong. P PRGE, not PGRE. Portland Retro Gaming Expo. So some people walked away with a copy of that game. From what I understand, only people that know or have the uh, have the secret info know how to get a copy of it. This is tough to uh, throw a fireball because the Atari again only has the one button. 
You have to push up and the button. Yeah, yeah. In television gamer P R G Portland Retro Gaming Expo P R G E. Stu's game reviews. What's going on? Welcome to my fun Atari stream. Why don't I just play random Atari games for the fun of it? You, know, you spend all day working, you gotta have some fun. I have this game, I paid way too much for it, but it's worth it. Yeah, well that's the th Ah, crap. That's the thing, if you want to have a game like this, you, you have to buy it from a collector or some reseller. I mean, some, anybody could really just take the ROM and dump it onto a cartridge, but... To have uh, one of the original run games, that would, that would be pretty impressive. There's also a Sonic the Hedgehog game, um, Zippy the Porcupine. Which I did end up buying a copy of it from Atari Age when they started their uh, last chance sale. Uh, where they were selling off the last of the unlicensed, I guess you can call them, games that they were selling. And uh, so I ended up buying a copy of that and uh, Mappy. Oh hey, a 1-Up. But uh, I haven't received the games yet. I know that there's a huge backlog, so... I mean, I've, that sale was in the summertime of last year, I think July. And I've heard a lot of people are still waiting for their games, so I'm, I'm just going to be patient. I'm not in a hurry. Oh, it's in the mail this past week for Stu. That's good. He's going to get his copy. I haven't, uh, I haven't received any email or anything like that. But I know that, uh, you know... They want to keep the quality. They don't want to just rush them out. They want to make sure you get a good product. And You know, if that means I have to wait a little bit, I'm okay. I'm not in a hurry. I have patience. <laughs> I've seen a few p people on um, on the Atari Age group and Facebook and, you know, they're saying, well, I, I, have, I still haven't got my games and what's going on. But from what I heard, um, there was like over a thousand orders or something he received and I don't know if he has any help I mean that's that's Albert uh, from Atari age I don't know if he has any help or if he's doing it all himself that's quite the task I mean a, a, a thousand games that he's got a box up and sticker and ship and yeah Stu say I don't think he has any help no I don't, I don't think he does I think he's doing it all on his own not to mention, he just started to officially work for Atari, from what I understand. So the guy's got a lot going on. I'm not gonna, you know, bust his chops because he's not getting to my game in the mail yet. You saw him at PRGE and he was talking about all the orders he was working on. Yeah. I'm sure it's an ongoing process for him. <laughs> And you have to keep in mind, it's not just Atari 2600, it's like all the different systems. He, he had some 7800 games, and I don't know if he had Jaguar and 5200, but... Oh, button failure. That was button failure. I pushed the button. I swear. It's funny how hard this one is. <laughs> I mean, if this was the uh, NES version, I would have completed it already. Oh no! Yeah, and Television Gamer was there too. You were there with Rev, weren't you? Boxing up some television games. Some of my games, probably. <laughs> ah! Game over. Yeah, 
Yeah, the Intellivision Homebrew uh, Awards have been announced. Uh, none of my games made it, but that's okay. I mean, all my games are pretty much uh, pretty simple games, and a lot of them were just games I created while I was learning how to program. So I'm hoping that maybe next year that uh, Napoleonic Wars will end up there as a uh, potential, but it's, it's hard to say. I mean, this this year's nominees, um, you're going up against Super Mario Brothers, Dragon Quest, which is also known as Dragon Warrior. So yeah, it's the, uh, you know, I got some pretty weird games that, uh, that came out, like Rags for Riches. Uh, I know Mike from Mike's Gaming Gala. He said he doesn't even understand the game. <laughs> He's gonna need me to to show him, uh, which I I did a I did a video with um, Papa Pete uh, explaining how to play it. But you know I, I think on, in his area, he's like you know if if a game requires that much explaining on how to play it, um, you know that's a problem there. But I copied the game that uh, was a Commodore 64 game that I spent a lot of time figuring out and playing and having a heck of a time doing it. So, uh, you know, maybe somebody, even if not many, will we'll give it a shot and spend some time on it. What else do we want to play here? from Donkey Kong. Actually, I'm Sean Vision, a legendary gamer, because I just won a video game tournament 40th in a row, and I was the Guinness Book of Records Gamers Edition. Pretty cool. Rex Warden saying my games are still solid. Well, that's good. At least I can know that. <laughs> I mean, some of my games are fairly simple games, uh, like fast food. Actually, I, uh, this one, fast food. <laughs> it's uh, just a port of an Atari game that I... Oh! Wasn't paying attention there. Maybe I can play that next, the, uh, the original fast food. I mean, my version, I, I just changed the graphics, and then I added on some extra levels. Uh, which I think it, it should be expected by now from anybody that's um, porting over some older Atari games to try and jazz it up. Don't just, don't just do a direct port. I mean, that's cool, too. I mean, we do deserve to have some games that look classic, that look like... This is how it would have looked if, if it actually got released on the Intellivision back in 1981 or whatever. Like, I mean, those are cool too, but I think if you want to build a great product, I'm on it. I'm on the side where Mike Mike's Gaming Gala is, where he he thinks that you know more more effort needs to be put into these games. Yeah, Rick Dynamite's a fun game. It's another game I need to spend a little bit more time playing. Need to do some more gameplay on it. I wish I could drive, but I live in New Jersey. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, going to these, these video game conventions, I've always thought about it. You know, I mean, you know, one day I should should make it an effort to do that. For the longest time, though, I didn't have my passport, but now I have it. So, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't even leave Canada. Good old Canada. I was stuck here in the Great White North. Uh, but now I have a passport, so I can actually travel if I want to go to a video game convention. Stand here. No! I shouldn't have moved. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. I mean, we I, I'd have to plan a whole thing around it. I'd, I'd, you know, 
take the whole family down kind of thing. Of course, I don't know anything about Portland or what's there. Let's try this again. exactly sure who made this version but this one is is definitely pretty stellar I mean yeah it does have some flickering but I mean sacrifice one to get another right you get a little bit of flickering but you get a better game <laughs> but somebody obviously made this one to kind of show off what the what the Atari could really pull off I mean we all know the original Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600 only had the first two boards and was very basic and easy. I mean, Mario looked okay. Obviously in this one, Donkey Kong looks a little strange. He's only half, half of himself. Um, and of course, like I said, there's some flickering. Right, you get the pie level. It's, it's it's always interesting how this this pie level was always um, excluded from original cartridge or console cartridge releases. Like the NES, the Intellivision, the ColecoVision, Atari. Only the computers had the the uh, pie level, which is strange. The one that baffled me the most was Nintendo, like the NES, that it didn't have the pie level. That one always baffled me. Like, I, I think I learned a little bit about why, you know, because it was originally on disc or, or it was like, I, I don't know, I guess, or it was on an earlier cart that didn't have a lot of space. I, I had some kind of meaning behind it, but... Shoot. I just I just don't understand like if if a if a Nintendo cartridge can have a game like Super Mario Brothers why couldn't it have Donkey Kong all four levels <laughs> Just didn't make sense to me But I still played it. I mean I I still end up I remember buying the uh Donkey Kong Classics in a uh retro kind of video game store downtown Toronto oops and it was pretty expensive it was like when I when I bought it anyways back in the day it was quite a long time ago I think I paid like 50 something dollars for it just for the cartridge alone I think it was on a 4k cart and they wanted to do it on 8k since many games at the time were getting 8k chips but no have to cut costs and expense for the final product. That, that's probably what it is, Rex. I mean, it's, usually it comes down to that. Let's save money. Give this one more go. And of course, you can always play the uh, DK Arcade on the Intellivision or the D2K which is a really good version. D2K gives you the extra four boards. So you get the eight in total. <laughs> Can't go, it's just so many barrels. Yeah made in 83 and they were using smaller memory sizes so they had to fit it in because also you have to think about it too is it was missing the uh you know the, the intro where kong climbs up the uh the two ladders and bangs on the board and you know and the uh in between each level you know the 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 
like these things, like the little animations and this screen. Everything was miss missing from the. Uh... And this level, of course, was on the ColecoVision version, but the springboards were the, uh, the the thing that made the level hard was missing, and that's those springboard things that are jumping. They are absent in the ColecoVision version, which is interesting. How high can you smoke? You notice that the uh, this board is actually pretty accurate to the original, and the fireballs are moving up and down the ladders, which on the original Donkey Kong, they don't do that. Um, not the original Donkey Kong, but the original Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600. They stay on their own platform, and they don't move up and down. Each platform has their own fireball. I'm assuming this version probably is pretty big file size that, uh, you know, uses a lot of memory. Who knows what, uh, what tools they had to use to make this one. I guess that's it. Doesn't go any further than that. Let's play something else. Oh yeah, I said I was going to play fast food, so let's play fast food. Where is it? Oops. Fast food. <laughs> Man, does that look ugly. Is this the right? Yeah. I don't know if I clicked on one that's like PAL version or something. Oh crap. Yeah, so I was, I, was, I, I think I was watching, um, maybe it was a Nosefair gamer was playing it. And I thought, you know, this game would be fairly simple. Well, not simple, but I, I think I'd be able to, to program a version of this for the Intellivision. So I set out to do so, and I ended up making one. So, <laughs> I mean, but when I did, you know, I originally programmed this. Oops. I um, I shared it to a testing group, and and one one person was like, you know, oh, it's fun for like five minutes and then I'm bored um, and then they were like you know how about um, adding some stuff to it so I'm like yeah that's a great idea and then people started throwing out some ideas and, and I thought you know let's let's do that so I ended up uh, adding in a bunch of different um, level uh, beyond the first one you know, in this one, it just, the, the difficulty increases oops, by things getting faster, and that's about it. A game that's similar to this is um, Taz, the Tasmanian Devil, which I think is a better game than this one, frankly. It's a similar idea where you've got to eat food that's being thrown at you and you have to avoid certain foods.
Stu's Game Reviews is asking, how long did it take me to learn in television programming? Um, well, to be fair, I did have a background in, in basic programming because I, I was programming a long time ago. Uh, I started back in the day on my Commodore 64. Then I took some programming classes in high school and in college I was learning some programming. So I, I already had somewhat of a background in it. Um, so learning on the Intellivision, I, I bought Oscar's book and a combination of reading the book and um, going on the Atari H forums, there's a programming section, uh, an Intellivision section, it has a programming section. And uh, I put a lot of questions in there. <laughs> and I was asking Oscar himself um, how to do certain things. And, um, but I, I would say within, um, like I had Keystone Cops programmed pretty much within the year after I started learning it. So uh, I also did a, um, that perfection game, Perfect. What you can download right now, if you go to um, my website, briansmancave.com, there's a program, uh, uh, sorry, an Intellivision tab where you can see all the, well, it's, I, I'm still working on it, so it's only got um, uh, perfect there, perfection, where you can download a free copy of it. But I'm also going to have Keystone Cops and Fast Food and probably some of my other games available um, to sell the ROM, essentially, so you can buy the ROM. I don't know when any newer game, like physical games are going to go for sale. That's going to be up to Rev at Intellivision Revolution uh, or any of the other vendors that I'm working with, like um, Napoleonic Wars is being sold. Um, this one here, this one's being sold through um, a Homebrew Inc. And um, I'm going to have some other games out. So, but yeah, some of the, uh, some of these games I'm going to have available through my website that you can just send an email to and um, get it that way. Okay, what else have we got to play? I like Hero. Hero is one of my favorites. Of course, this one also exists on the Intellivision, courtesy of Carlos Madruga. He's done a lot of great ports. Always remember, take the take the pathway that looks like it's not the fun one. Don't take the uh, pathway that looks safe. It's not going to be the good one when you're deciding which hole to go down. <laughs> this just takes a lot of memorization. I used to play this on the train ride home from work on my phone. I had the uh, I had this Activision Atari Activision Classics app on my phone. After a while, it's it. Um, I think they discontinued it and it stopped working, but, um, crap. Yeah, I used to play this on my phone. I could only get so far, though, because, you know, playing on a touch screen, this type of game, once the levels started getting hard, forget it. <laughs> Without actually using a real joystick. This is one game I say that this was built for the uh, original Atari joystick. Because you need that the firmness of the, of the joystick. You don't want something that's too... Oh, jeez, that's too close. You don't want something that's too loose. Because you want to be precise on this one. I'm already doing pretty terrible. I'm down to two guys left. I 
to touch those glowing walls, they'll kill you. Ah, crap. Saw that happening when I did it. No more men. Oh, just got one. This is always hard because you can't go down too far. Else you'll hit that lava crap at the bottom. Level nine. Only tells you what level you are on when you're at that that part. Ouch. Thought I hit him. I hate it when you run out of dynamite and then you have to use your laser to break a wall. It takes forever. <laughs> oh! Thought I was at the end there. <laughs> Went in thinking it was going to be a Nice pathway, but it turned out to be a trench. Oops. Ah. Oh. Not too bad. Level 10. I could live with that. <laughs> is here. Ah, oh, there's another classic. Gary Kitchen classic. There's a reason why I picked this game to be my actual first full game to program because I always loved this game on the Atari. Although, you know, the fact is it was my first full game that I that I created and uh, you know, I, I did have to learn a whole lot of stuff to, to really make the game work. And now I wonder if I tried to do it again if how, how it would be any different knowing what I know now and all the things that I've gotten to learn over the years, if I would have made it any different. Yeah, don't go to the roof if the bad guy's not up there. Hey, it's Mike's Gaming Gala. You made the stream. I was just talking about you. All good things, I promise. Decided to play some Keystone Keepers.
Yeah, at one point I was like, you know, thinking maybe I could go back over my old code and see if I can make any kind of tweaks or changes to it. But, um, I mean, after I was looking at it, I was like, no, I'd, I'd probably have to, like, recode the whole thing from the game, from the ground up, so what's the point? <laughs> yeah, watch it back to make sure I didn't say anything wrong. I'd say the, the biggest challenge, well, some of the challenges I had when I was coding this one, Keystone Cops, was this area here, the elevator, or the escalator. That one, I think, took me the longest to figure out how to get the escalator to work. Um, but the other thing that, that was the challenge is, is this, having that amount of sprites on the screen. Um, the Intellivision has a limit of, of eight sprites. And uh, for Keystone Kelly, he uses uh, three sprites right there because you got the black hat, the skin, you know, short of me making them all one color. Um, and same with the robber, right? I could, I could have taken that route and said, okay, the Keystone Kelly will just be blue. The robber will be all white. And that would have opened up, oops, oops. That would have opened up a lot of sprites for me. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to kind of look like this game. I didn't want it to look like, you know, a really poor version of it on the Intellivision. Um, so yeah, when I, was, when I was coding it, I'm like, okay, how am I gonna get all these different sprites on the screen? Because the, the Atari 2600, has the ability to replicate the sprite um, like three times. Like you can have the same sprite replicated. The Intellivision doesn't really do that. You kind of have to figure out all your sprites. So um, for Keystone Kelly, like I said, he, he's three sprites alone. The helmet, the face, and the, and the body. Three different sprites. Um, because his uh, billy stick is, his, is oops, it's part of his face. Um, and the crook, I didn't want him to be monocolored. I wanted him to have the black and white. So I knew I had to at least have two sprites for him. So we're up to five sprites. Plus we have the escalator, which required, I believe, two sprites on its own. I think it was two. I'm trying to remember now. So either two or three, but shoot. But uh, yeah, because I had to keep in mind that there's a possibility that the robber uh, or the crook or whatever you want to call him, Keystone Kelly and the escalator could all be present on the same screen. And so all of the sprites would have to be available, which kind of made things more complicated. <laughs> I mean, in hindsight, I think I, I think I know how I kind of would get around it now. But back then, I was just like so confused. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So pretty much, I just focused on the the uh, level you were on. That's where the obstacle would be. <laughs> I mean, it's a small detail, but it's it's one of those ones that kind of bothered me when I was trying to figure it all out. You know, a lot of that, uh, the whole thing about the sprite, whoop, the sprite limitations and all that stuff. I mean, when I was learning this style of programming, uh, I was doing it on a computer, on a software like Adobe Flash and uh, uh, Director and all that stuff, which obviously had no limitations to it. So it was quite challenging <laughs> when I was first trying to figure it all out. Not to mention things like the airplane required two sprites. If, if you notice, there's a yellow and black to it. And, and the uh, shopping carts, they require two sprites. Um, without making everything, again, making it one color. 
And if you look at a lot of the older Intellivision games, you'll notice that certain characters and certain things only have solid color, one color. Like, think about Lock and Chase. Um, all of the uh, police are all monocolor. And the... Um, the bad guy, he, he's about three or four colors. Each color is a, a different sprite because a sprite can only contain one color. So you basically build your character with multiple sprites that overlap each other just to build up the color scheme. It's quite interesting when you get into programming to, to you start to look back at some of these older games and you realize how uh, how much work went into these things. You know, back when I was a kid, I didn't understand it. I was like, why couldn't the why couldn't it play like this? Why couldn't it do that? Why not this? Like, why does it have to look like that? I didn't understand it. Now I fully understand it. Yeah, Mike's like, I wish I had the time to learn to program. I mean, I, I had that foundation already, so... I mean, learning how to program on the television uh, was just taking what I already knew and, and just kind of tweaking it around to understand the capabilities. I'm still not even close to some of the better programmers out there. I mean, there's a lot I still don't understand, especially when it gets into memory and mapping and all that stuff. I don't know. Like, I've asked questions on the Atari, or on the, yeah, on the Atari Age forums, you know, somebody explain this to me, and, and I'll get all these answers, and I read it, and I'm like, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> you know, especially when it gets into complicated math equations. Forget it. I have no such foundation. Yeah. Well, that would just make it a little bit tougher. You'd have to learn the basics before you'd even start trying. My thing is, I, I, I want to still learn how to make an Atari game. That's, that's you know, one thing that's been on my to-do list. But kind of like what Mike, Mike said there, you know, having the time to sit down and learn it um, is another thing. Like when I uh, when I asked Oscar about his book about learning how to program for the the Intellivision, I told him I was already familiar with um, a language called QBasic, uh, which is like on the PC. It's a very similar language, and he said um, if I understand that, then I shouldn't have any problems understanding Int Basic, which is the language used to program. Uh, in television games and so I was like okay I'll give it a go <laughs> I really thought I was gonna buy the book and be completely lost and be like forget it but uh, when he said that I was like okay I'll give it a try but I bought I bought the uh, programming games for the Atari 2600 uh, also written by him and um, like I said earlier it's an assembly language, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to understand it. However, there is, for the Atari, uh, a language called Butari Basic. Which, I, I'll probably have a better chance figuring out then. The only question is, what kind of game would I make? I mean, so far for the Intellivision, I've, I've been making ports of games, and... Um, ports of, of previous Atari games. So, other than Napoleonic Wars, which uh, I don't, I, I'm not really sure where I got the inspiration to make that one. I think I was just like, maybe I looked at the board game and I was like, you know, that would make it a, a great Intellivision game. I think uh, if I try to make a, an Atari game, I'm going to probably make one of those uh, kind of like adventure 
you know, where you kind of have to go into different rooms and find things and that type of game. I, that's probably the type of game I'd probably try to make first. Running out of time, I'm running out of time. Move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. That was close. No, no. When you get this far into the game, it really matters if you get hit. Like you almost can't complete it. Oh no, oh no, definitely not gonna make it now. Unless I get lucky with the elevator. The only time I recommend using the elevator is at this stage. Or with that damn airplane. Like, yeah, see, now I'm gonna be there. Where is he? That took too long. I still got him. Yeah, the elevators really only help you in the later. Oh shoot, in the later levels. I remember doing that too with my Keystone Cops game, trying to map out, uh, figure out how the, the elevators could work. You know, making making the different, you know, the timing on them. Dang it. Oh. <laughs> Whew, just made it in. Two shopping carts. Go, Kelly. Whoa. That's one fast airplane. I think I have to do the uh, elevators now. Crap. It's all the way up there now. He's all the way at the top. Shoot. Come on, come on, come on. Open, open, open. Yeah, that's right, Dan. Oh, Dan Kitchen's been working on uh, Gold Rush. Well, it's like a kind of a sequel to this one. It's, I think it's supposed to be Keystone Kelly's cousin or something like that. And it takes place on a train. I'm assuming it's going to be similar to the Circus Convoy that they put out. But they did stress that they were not going to put they're not going to rush the game out or any other games out for that matter. They're going to put it out when they're good and ready. Um, you know, they got a lot on the go. And uh, they they kind of made that clear that they're not going to, you know, oh crap. He turned around. Go get him. He hits the el escalator, I'm screwed. Okay. So who knows when it's going to come out. I mean, they're not... They also said they wouldn't announce it until they were good and ready to do it either. Like, literally, the game is done. Oh, did I hit the ball? Like, they're not going to put out, like, a... Oh, we're going to release it way before they have the game ready or anything like that. So I'm assuming when it's ready, they're just going to come out with it. That's... <laughs> Just gonna get some announcement like the game is ready. Oh, that was a pretty good run. Yeah, Mike's Gallagher, Gaming Gal, Gal, Gaming Gala, Mike's Gaming Gala. So you, you, 
respects the hell out of that approach. Of course, like they don't want to, you know, lead people astray and say, yeah, it's coming out in February, and then all of a sudden it's March, April, still no game. Like, it looks bad. Play some lost luggage because it sucks. <laughs> No, this is actually a pretty a decent game for what it is. Not starting or what? fast these guys go. Whee. All right, let's get some luggage. Basically kaboom. I mean, let's be real here. <laughs> it just gives you this option of being able to go up and down, which I don't know if there's any really strategic advantage to that. I mean, it lets you get the, the thing a little bit quicker, I guess. This one, you can go back after it. They could have at least made the guys turn around when, when you push the, uh, the left button. Like, again, you know, that, that's something like on the Intellivision, um, there's a, a, a command that allows you to flip the X, X position of a sprite. So you can easily do it on the Intellivision. You just uh, put in that piece of code that says flip X, and then it, it turns the sprite to the opposite direction. So when you're coding a game and, and you, you need the character to turn around, you just flip the sprite. You don't have to create a whole new sprite just to flip it, which is which is pretty cool. It's pretty uh, interesting how it, you know they, they thought of that when they were creating the Intellivision. It saves you an extra bitmap, and as far as coding is concerned, you just have to put in a tiny little piece of code. If, if you push left, make this happen. I am working on another game right now, actually, but I'm not going to give any details about it until I'm very confident um, that I can make it work. But it is a game that I used to play a lot as well, so hopefully I can get myself to a point where I feel comfortable. I've been really focusing on the, the character movement, uh, which is the most important part of the game, is the character movement. Um, and then I'll be focusing on the uh, once I once I get to that that comfort zone, then um, I just have to work on the enemies. And uh, if I get to a point where I feel comfortable that, yeah, I, I can do it, I can make this game a, a reality. I'll definitely share it with everyone. Oh no, my underwear. Sharp, do you think it's worth getting an Atari 2600 in 2024? Hey, well, that, that's a, it's really up to you. Um, I mean, some people get it because of nostalgia reasons, like they grew up with an Atari or they played one when they were a kid or always wanted one when they were a kid. Um, definitely, if, if you want that. Um, or if you're just, even if you're a newer, younger gamer and you want to experience the old games, the thing is, there's many ways to do it now, right? You don't have to go with the original system. You can get, um, you can get all these device, like emulation devices, that have games already programmed in there. You can download the emulator on your computer. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can play these games. So, um, 
there's the Atari 2600 Plus you can get. So there's lots of lots of options out there for for playing Atari in today's world. But you know, for us people that that played it when we were kids, we like to have these original uh, the original system. And of course, if you have the means to to set it up, hook it up. Yeah, uh, what Rex is saying, if you if you must get a 7800, so you can play both 7800 and 2600 games. Uh, that's that's pretty it's pretty good advice there. Only I would say though, it's easier to get your hands on a 2600 than a 7800. You'll probably pay a little bit more money for the 7800. Um, because there's a ton of 2600s. Like there's the 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 light six or the heavy six or the 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 Vader or the you know. There's like tons of the, the, the four switches, the, the junior, the Gemini. There's so many systems out there to play Atari 2600. And then there's the modern systems out there. I bought a 700 box recently from the store. It wasn't that expensive. Nice. Sears Arcade, yeah. You name it. Yeah, I used to play when I was a kid on my cousin's Atari 2600. By the way, I'm 40 years old. Well, you're still younger than me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you grew up with it and you want to have that feeling again, nothing beats an original 2600. And you know, if, if you only have a modern TV, you still can hook it up. I mean, there's still a way. There's still, you know, there's devices you can get a... That little plug, the little RCA to coax plug thing. I mean, there's there's lots of ways you can do it. If you have a VCR, you can plug into the VCR. Seeing what else we have to play. I know a good one to play. Nice, quick, classic. Let's play some Yars Revenge. Oops. It's been a while since I played this one. I have this now for the television. It's still in the uh, shrink wrap. I don't know if I'm going to open it or not. If I'll ever get around to it. Always appreciate it when Grandpa 2600 gets some spotlight. Respect your elders, son. Couple of extra modes on the Intellivision version. 
Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, I just looked at the uh, the box. I was like, is it just like the original, and that's it? So I know some games were ported over and pretty much just stuck to the original concept, didn't even do any. I already thought that would be cool to have extra levels or something like that. Oh. I mean, you can have all these kind of funny sequels, like, You're Kidding Me or something. Or You're Making Me Crazy. I know there was like a, a second Yars Revenge for the, it was, ended up on the flashback. It had like different areas. <laughs> Mr. Poe style. Yars on the Intellivision, blasphemy. There's lots of Atari games you can play on Intellivision now. It's even crazy when you play games like um, the original Atari Soft games on the Intellivision and you boot the game up and you see the Atari logo. Although back then it was pretty common for um, playing competitors' games on, on consoles. You didn't... Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't too weird that you'd be playing uh, like Donkey Kong, which is a Nintendo game released by Coleco and played on the Intellivision. I mean, that was just common back then. Although now I'm starting to see a lot of games are, you know, obviously being ported to multiple systems at once. So it's starting to become common again. But they're like third-party developers. Yeah, the Wild West of gaming. Well, at the time, I mean, to be fair, Nintendo didn't even have a console. Like when, when Intellivision's Donkey Kong came out, they didn't even have a console anyways. I think they were like in talks with like Atari and stuff like that to make their own console. supposed to touch the enemy. I think I'm playing some weird prototype version. <laughs> so that's the only, the only thing about that game is it gets tired for me after a while. Play another favorite of mine, Adventure. Yar Wars! Yeah! <laughs> there we go. It's another game that I, I started working on as well, making a kind of a sequel to this game. I mean, I have already a working kind of prototype. I just got to really develop the game itself. I mean, I have to create all the levels and then create more to it than just just grabbing treasure. <laughs> but I do have a, uh, you know, I have a lot of it programmed already where it's working. You get Winky and you can shoot. And the enemies appear. I just need to really come up with I don't know, I, I need to sit down and just create all the levels. I want it to be more of an adventure game than just go into a room, get out of a tra treasure and leave. Let's go, Winky. 
Maybe I should have played Venture Reloaded. It's a better version. <laughs> this is the original one that Coleco made. Go away, Hall Monster. Nobody likes you. This is another one I actually prefer playing on the Intellivision. I, I like that version better. I mean, it was one of my constant go-tos when I was a kid. This one and uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons were my two favorites that I always played. Go away. No! Jerk. Zelda clone. Yeah. I mean, we do have some similar, but like some homebrews came out that are sort of like a Zelda style, but nothing close. Nothing that can be like, oh yeah, that's definitely Zelda. Bought this game from Kmart mostly because I thought somehow it was a sequel to Adventure just because of the name. And it had an awesome white cartridge. Yeah, I guess so. Adventure? Adventure? <laughs> Could sound like a sequel. If anything, this 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 game's a little bit more like Berserk. Except in this one, you actually just have a real goal to get the uh, treasure and get out. on this one it doesn't tell you which which boards you've completed uh, like normally when you complete a board it, it shows up as a solid block instead of just the outline but on this version no you have to remember which ones you've completed These guys especially look like they're right out of Berserk. And the way the hall monster attacks when you take too long. Just wait for a minute. He'll come. No, he doesn't want to come. No hall monster? Well, that's straight. Oh, there he is. <laughs> He's just one of these guys that just decides to come in all of a sudden. <laughs> I was a kid at Kmart with, with paper route money burning a hole in my pocket. I had to buy something and ended up really liking it. Yeah, I remember doing that with uh, Commodore 64 games too. There's always these like random Commodore 64 games. It's like literally just the disc in a plastic sleeve and maybe a little bit of a printout of what the game was. And I remember buying those from Kmart and uh, also some of my Intellivision games I bought from Kmart when they were cheap. But usually they just had the same old ones all the time like Snafu and Astro Smash and S Space Armada. Always the same games over and over. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Move, Leaky! Yes, another one of those games where it's missing the third board. Or the last board. Oh 
Oh god, they're moving fast. Burn Dog, 1461. Anyone remember the arcade room in suburban Sears department stores in the late 70s and early 80s? I sure as heck don't, but <laughs> I was a little tiny kid back in those days, so I'm sure I didn't get to go into the Sears too often. Unless my mom dragged me in there to buy clothes or something. I was too poor to, too poor to shop at Sears. <laughs> yeah, I like that you play as Evil Auto. You look like Evil Auto, but you're not. I don't know, for my idea for the uh, for a sequel to this, I wanted to play kind of like so similar to this, where it plays similar, but you can um, get different arrows that do different things. You can get different armor, so then he'll turn different colors, kind of like in Zelda, where, you know, in Zelda, where you get the ring and then his uh, color turns red or blue, you know, that type of thing, so you can get different items that will beef up Winky and different arrows to kill different uh, enemies. And then of course you have to get keys to open up doors. Like that's the kind of game I want to turn it into. This is Taz. This is the one I was saying earlier that it's kind of similar to uh, fast food in that um, the goal is to eat the food and avoid the dynamites. Instead of purple pickles, it's dynamite. I bought this game and I played the heck out of it back when I had my Atari Junior. I liked it. I mean, I bought the game not even knowing what the game was like. I just saw the package, the box, and I'm like, cool, a game about Taz? I want it. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, uh, there's another game called Asterix. I think it's a European one. It's like a PAL game. Uh, and it's in Europe and I don't know if that one came first. It's exactly like this except the character looks a little bit different and the uh, items look different but exactly the same game. I just don't know which one came out first. Whether it was this one or that one. This is another game where you need a really good controller. Good controller and you really have to concentrate because it gets crazy at some point brother had Taz and I had fast food. Huh. Oh, got blown up. Kind of in my fast food game uh, for the Intellivision, you know, playing um, the level where the purple pickles are falling from the sky, you kind of play in this same kind of fashion. You gotta really move your, your guy around the screen a lot to avoid things. Actually, when I when I was making the decision to, to, to make fast food, I was I was debating whether I should try and make this one or fast food. I don't know if I would have been able to pull this one off. Um, it would it definitely wouldn't have been like this. Uh, I know for sure. <laughs> I 
This does require a lot more um, sprites on the screen, and um, it would I'd probably end up having to make them all single colored, and I don't think it would look that good. So I, I ultimately decided to go with fast food. So I knew I'd, I'd be able to pull that one off. There's a power glove when you need one. This is a uh, gonna be a thumb killer for sure. Hey, the ice cream cones. The popsicles. I think they're, they might be next. They're, that's one, it's a hard one because they kind of look like they're dynamite. Especially if you're moving too fast. Popsicles, they're, they're kind of similar to the, you know, like when things start moving fast, your eyes are getting blurry. We found that these, these guys are a little bit harder. Ah. This is not a good game to try and play and read the comments at the same time, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> now you should make slow food for us guys over 50 with reduced reaction speed. That's funny. Slow food. The pickles give us old guy acid reflux. That is true. That is very true. Let's play a little bit of Montezuma. No! This one's quite impressive for an Atari game. I was kind of impressed when I first played this one. I was like, wow, they actually did a really good job on it. I wasn't expecting much when I first heard about it. Oh crap, I didn't want to do that. Or that. Or that. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up, I swear. I don't normally play this bad. Got squished. Squish, there's a squish. Come on. This is what I wouldn't mind actually getting the cartridge for. 
I haven't tried to really source it out, but I don't think it's cheap. Getting hit by these crazy lasers. I think I have to go down. I think I have to go the other way. It's amazing. An enemy that doesn't move. And it's like one of the biggest pains in the butt. Just like in Pitfall. You know, there's certain things that just sit there and kill you no matter what. I used to know how to get pretty far in this game. Now I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I'm like, where, where do I go? Which way do I go? Ah. And I didn't make those mistakes either. Oh, all right. I think I'm done for the night. <laughs> I'm just totally uh, playing horrible. But yeah, thanks everybody for coming in. It's been a pleasure seeing everybody pop into the chat. We got Mike's Gaming Gala there. We got Mr. Pole Style. Fern Dog. Who else have we got going on here? Rex Warden. Monterant. Monterant. Sharp. Am, am I saying that right? Stu's Game Reviews. The Intellivision Gamer. 3D Texan. Did I miss anyone? Sean the Great Gamer. And we had the Atari Creep at one point. He was here for a little bit. Anyways, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for popping in. And uh, now I need to get some, some sleep. Because tomorrow's work. But at least Friday we have off. We have Good Friday coming up. So, so nice, uh, nice chance to sleep in. Get some rest. I'm looking forward to it. Anyways, take care.